compassion, um, what you find is as long as you try to associate compassion for objects, I, we did a talk recently on love, love has no object, but as long as it's objectified, compassion for people and animals and mother nature and all the different things, you're, you're going to find that there are times that you're not compassionate, you actually have a lot of rage that's there as well. And, and it's back to those dualistic kind of things. It may just pop its head up every once in a while. It may come out like his road rage, for example. Like I go down to New Zealand and it's, you know, Lord of the Rings and it's just, ooh, it's beautiful, it's mystical, it's sunny, the islands, it's spectacular. And I'm doing these kind of gatherings down in New Zealand and we're talking and they go, somebody says, well, we have a, a, an issue down here. And I said, what's your issue in New Zealand? They said, Everything is so beautiful down here, but we can hardly find anything to get upset at. It's just, it's idyllic, you know. I'm talking to a group down there, that it's a problem though. We said, so what's the problem? They said, well, it's so beautiful that we, we can't get upset except for road rage. We just are about ready to kill. <laughs> it comes out on the road, you know. They just, they have deaths on the road, you know. People bring guns and you know, <laughs> it's like they have a lot of road rage in New Zealand because everything else is so beautiful. It's got a, the rage has to come up somewhere and it comes up in that way yeah. and they're working on healing that. So it, it, in order to have true compassion, it's not so much compassion for things, but you know, compassion I think is synonymous with love and when, when you live in a state of non-judgment, you naturally stay in a state of ultimate compassion because you accept everyone and everything regardless of what happens. There have been times, there was one time I was visiting a friend who I had met briefly before that and we would, we would just watch movies and we would meditate together sometimes for hours. She failed to mention that she had divorced her husband about two years ago and he was insanely jealous if anybody would come near her that was of the male gender. So one day we're watching movies, metaphysical movies and meditating and then all of a sudden this face appears in the window and it's, one of, it's like one of those Jack Nicholson you know, movies. The eyeballs are bugged out and it looks like somebody's ready to come in with a chainsaw and just, you know. And so I remember at the time, um, this window, window, there's these eyeballs and then there were, and then the door just blasts open and, and there's saliva coming out of the man. I mean, like really super angry, raging angry at him. And I remember she was back on the couch, and I forget which movie we were watching from, the movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. But I was there reclining on the, <laughs> on the uh, floor, watching the movie, and my eyes kind of turned over to the kitchen door where this monster <laughs> was coming in. But I so much am aware that it's all just a movie, that I didn't even move positions, I didn't even get up. <laughs> I just stayed there, continued watching the movie, and continued to watch as he came over, and then I was screaming, shouting, and then reaching down and grabbing the shirt. I still am in the same position. I haven't even, <laughs> even moved at this point. There's been no defensive measures taken <laughs> at this point. It's a movie. I'm, that's a movie, that's a movie. Okay, well that's an interesting movie. It looks like this, and I don't know what we were watching. So it's, it's getting stretched and everything. Anyway, she comes off the back couch like a linebacker. For the, in the NFL. Her adrenaline was really gone at this point. And I still am in the same position. <laughs> like this. And she hit him and drove him all the way across the room and out the door. And there was even some blood. I saw, I mean, you know, in the NFL you get some really good hits and there's some blood. Sort of, there was some adrenaline going there. And I just was like looking at my shirt, it was a little stretched. That was the only thing. I'm still in the same position. But, and that was, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. Wow. It, it's, now that's compassion. And later on, when I would be going off to walk some days later to a pine forest nearby to, um, to meditate, 
I was walking along and the car drove up, and again it was him. And he jumped out of that car, and he came over and he threw this body down on the ground, and it actually there was like a, a metal signpost, like a pole there, and the head hit it. There was even some blood coming out, which I didn't feel. I, I, I was not feeling any discomfort whatsoever. And then he kind of, you know, picked me, I, I, a car stopped, said, what's going on here? He said, no, there's no problem, and he picked me up and he took me back, and he was even fumbling through the, the medicine chest and spilling pills all over the place, saying, he, she had talked to him about me a bit, she, he was spilling pills all over going, I know you don't even feel pain or believe in this, but he was so scared. He was trying to put gauze on the head and trying to give me pills because, and then he, he cracked open about the pain that he felt of losing his family and the hurt. And it just turned into this beautiful healing experience of true compassion, where it was just used in, in the most deepest way. And that is really addressing what you're saying, because the temptation can believe, if you just reach a state where you see the world as an illusion, that you would become um, disinterested or, you know, you would have no sense of love or compassion flowing through you. But the Spirit still pours through, even from that state, in fact even more so when you don't have an investment in the form being a certain way, looking a certain way. But that's, that's a great question because that, that would be something that would be common to ask, like why if you're so detached and you see the world's an illusion? That takes a lot of mind training to come to that state. And I, this body's been used in many countries around the world, in third world countries, and I'm going to places where they have guns and all kinds of things because I'm not invested in this, then I can truly teach peace because I could be fearless. And fearlessness and compassion go together. They really do. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yes. So I I used to be an angry activist. I sometimes <laughs> I sometimes still get like that. But are you saying, you know, just be love and don't sign any petitions. Uh, let your sprinklers go for hours and <laughs> you know, that kind of it I just like for me that is such a switch. It would make my life a lot easier, I'm telling you. <laughs> Gosh. You could be a peaceful activist. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know do we just let the whole thing go to whatever and, and you know because it's just an illusion? Are we just is in a state of existential angst? Because now what has meaning if it's all an illusion? How do I bring meaning into something that is not real? Which is, uh, I'm, I'm good with that state, I don't, it does, that's fine. But it is, a, it is a hard concept, I think. Yeah, it takes, it's almost like this whole healing is, is turning everything right side up that was upside down. There's a line in the Course that says, you are the goal the world is searching for. Wow, my parents never told me that. <laughs> I am the goal the world is searching for. Now if I was a teenager, I would go, all sure. right, I told you so. But we're not talking a personality self is the goal, you know, it's, it's your Christ self. Your true identity is the goal the world is searching for. And so, it's good that you're bringing this up because if you listen to us, we go through the day, we link in and join on everything through the day. We're just totally aware of, of connecting, of thoughts. There's nothing too big or too small. We're connecting, connecting. It's a lot of attentiveness. Maybe the, the Buddhists would talk mindfulness or attentiveness. You're really just tuning into the Holy Spirit in the most total way you could ever even imagine. And so that's the meaning. The meaning comes from the Spirit, not from the objects. And that's part of what forgiveness is about. We're used to thinking the meaning comes from the form and the objects. And then when the form shifts, we get all upset. Because it's like, oh no, that's not supposed to happen that way. When you come from a place of forgiveness, then you get all the way around to see that the meaning is in your heart. And you bring that beautiful meaning to everything that you look upon. You know, you take that love in your heart and you just let it pour out on absolutely everything. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And when you're beholding the love, that's what happens. 
Yeah, we also need to look at it. Uh, I feel like what's coming to me is um, the course is teaching. Do not try to change the world, but change your mind about the world because it's all a projection, really. And so even the idea that I am a compassionate person can really be questioned because it's actually an attack. Thinking that there's someone or a country or somewhere outside of myself that needs help is actually an attack upon Christ, upon who we are. And it's really weakening who we think we're helping, actually, and ourselves in the same time, because we, we keep strengthening that help needs to come from outside. And, and I feel like it's really important to look at that, because if we don't have a peaceful mind and we, and we try to help others, it's actually misleading ourselves, because we, we have all the answers inside, and it doesn't mean that we'll never take action, but it will be given by the Spirit, the only one who truly knows what true compassion is. And, and I feel that, um, yeah, it's just really important to come back to that more and more and to really look, who do I think that, I, that need my help? And, and looking at, it's all judgment. And the only one who needs help when I think that someone needs my help is me. It's me to remember who I am because what, what I'm seeing right in front of me is actually a call for love. And it's always my own. And when I answer that call for love, my perception change. And so I don't see anybody outside of myself who needs help because all in the present moment, all is love. And, and if I am guided to take action, it will come from a place of true compassion. It will, call, it will come from a place of wholeness and there's no one to fix. And I might take action. And sometimes it gets, people will say, well, it just sounds so passive. It sounds absolutely so passive. If they should have seen how active this body has been for the 31 countries and going amongst the poor and all these cities, just on and on and on, and offering the love and the compassion to children and all kinds of people. You know, it's not been just kind of sitting under the Bodhi tree and going, it's an illusion, Maya, 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 for 30, for the last 25 years, this body has been all over the place. Not just to the 31 countries, but I've been, the body, you could say, has gone around the world many, many, many times out of this letting it pour out. Uh, I go down to Argentina, for example, and I'm on, go to Buenos Aires, and, and the economy's collapsed, and they have little children, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten teenagers out juggling in the streets or doing little acts uh, to feed their families, you know, they, to get a few coins, you know, so they can take some money home. And so when I go down there and I'm in, on the streets and everything, I've got my little pocket, you know, a little thing with coins in. And a friend who was with me, Maria Christina Uar, she brought little angels. So she, and they love Jesus. And they, so we would give them coins and angels, and they would, their faces would light up like, oh, they look, you know. And so the Spirit still uses the symbols to bring joy, to inspire, but it's not done from a place of, I've got something that you don't, that I'm advantaged and you're disadvantaged. You see, is that the kind of attitude that we would want to teach? If we're all the same one, if we're all the Christ, we let the abundance of the Spirit pour through us in our joy, in our happiness, in our beatitudes. We let the symbols of the world be used where, where smiles can come and happiness can come. We bring music, we do, we do dances, you know, we, we don't just passively sit there and om for the last 25 years in a passive way. What we're talking about, there's an idea in the Course that comes in where Jesus is talking about true empathy. And he's saying, always stay in your mind with what's real and true. And that is really, that takes a lot of practice when you're tempted to misperceive as somebody less than or lacking and so forth. When you're actually there to, to emanate and to radiate the truth. And then that, that's like, I would say that would be more true compassion in the way that, that we're defining it just radiating the truth. Yeah, and that's where the miracle occurs actually. It's 
that when you stay in the truth and you refuse to see your brother for something that he's not, that's when the miracle can occur. And that you, he's lifting up actually to remember in the same time that you hold the presence, he's lifting up to remember who he is too. And I feel like that is the most compassionate thing ever.